Bon retour à tous. Nous allons continuer les activités de Tax Co-op avec la soirée citoyenne. Mais juste avant, euh, comme vous le savez, Brigitte Alpin, Harold Crooks et Tax Co-op ont produit le documentaire « Rapide et dangereuse, une course fiscale vers l'abîme » qui a été diffusé en anglais en première ce soir, euh, aujourd'hui, et qui sera diffusé en français à ICI RDI ce soir à 20 h ce documentaire important examine les dangers de la concurrence fiscale internationale et il a été réalisé en six mois seulement et durant le contexte de la pandémie. Et donc, nous avons lancé un concours sur nos réseaux sociaux pour inviter les participants à utiliser le mot-clic « Tax Coop 2020 » et à s'abonner à notre infolettre pour courir la chance de participer à une rencontre « Making of » avec l'équipe de production du documentaire et d'avoir la chance, la chance d'échanger avec eux et avec l'équipe de production. Et donc, nous avons quatre gagnants qui ont été choisis. Ce sont Karina Demers, Georges Correa, Guillaume Bellec et Kazen Zotkai. Alors, vous pouvez continuer à utiliser le mot-clic « Tax Coop 2020 » et il y a quatre autres gagnants qui seront choisis ce soir et demain. And with that, we're very happy to be able to continue uh, the panel that was cut short at the end of the day on uh, Tuesday. And we're fortunate that three renowned speakers are available to exchange with us this evening. They are representatives of NGOs and civil society groups who are working to improve tax justice. And they will discuss tax fairness, justice, and transparency and the importance of maintaining an emphasis on these values during a time of crisis. So we are joined with Madame Huguette Labelle. Madame Labelle has served for a period of 19 years as Deputy Minister of different Canadian government departments, including Secretary of State, Transport Canada, the Public Service Commission, and the Canadian International Development Agency. A former Chancellor of the University of Ottawa, former Chair of Transparency of Inter International, and former board member of the UN Global Compact. She has also served on several additional boards, including International Anti -Corruption, the International Anti-Corruption Academy and the Advisory Group of the OECD Secretary General on Anti-Corruption and Integrity. Madame Labelle will be joined by Toby Sanger, Sanger, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He is an executive director for Canadians for Tax Fairness since 2018. He is a senior economist. Uh, he is part of the Canadian Union of Public Employees from 2005 and until 2018. He holds a bachelor in economics from McGill University and a master's in economics from Dalusi. And uh, our guests will be in conversation with our moderator, William Ross. William has been coordinator of the Échec au Paradis Fiscal Collective since 2020. The Échec au Paradis Fiscal Collective is a valued partner of Tax Co-op 2020, so we're happy uh, to, to have William with us. Um, the organization was founded in 2010. And the Echeco Paradis Fiscal Collector brings together social organizations from labor, student, community, and economic movements. It has nearly 1.7 million members. The collective's mandate is to feed the public debate on the phenomenon of the use of tax havens and to formulate, support, and disseminate potential solutions to end it. Citizen education, consultation with legislators, and popular mobilization are among the means of action of the collective. William Ross is currently completing a thesis in philosophy at the Université de Montréal. And without further ado, I am pleased uh, to have William be in conversation with Huguette and Toby. Bonjour à tous. Merci d'être parmi nous uh, aujourd'hui. Uh, Merci d'abord à Tammy de nous avoir introduit. Merci aussi à toute l'organisation de Tax Coop, Brigitte, euh, Louise et Lynn, de nous avoir donné la chance de pouvoir reprendre euh, la soirée qui a été malheureusement interrompue en raison d'un problème technique. Nous sommes très heureux euh, d'être ici euh, avec vous aujourd'hui. Donc, euh, euh, j'aurai la chance, après mon allocution, de laisser Mme Huguette Labelle parler et suivie de euh, M. Toby Sanger, qui euh, s'entretient tiendront au, euh, au sujet de la justice fiscale en temps de crise. Donc, si vous me le permettez, je vais d'abord reprendre la locution que j'étais censé vous donner mardi, qui a été euh, malheureusement interrompue. 
Euh, donc, j'ai débuté avec une évidence. Hein. L'année euh, 2020 a été tout sauf une année normale. Et il est possible cependant qu'elle nous offre la meilleure occasion de questionner ce que devrait être notre normalité. Dès les débuts de la crise sanitaire, il y a beaucoup de gens qui ont scandé « pas de retour à la normale ». Il signifiait par là que la normalité n'était pas quelque chose vers laquelle il fallait retourner, mais plutôt quelque chose que nous devions encore inventer. Pensez la norme de l'avenir. Voici à, ce à quoi nous sommes tous confrontés. Devant les défis de notre époque, que ce soit la crise climatique et écologique, la réorganisation de nos sociétés, frappée par une crise sanitaire ou encore les inégalités croissantes qui menacent nos démocraties, nous savons que nous devons trouver dans l'urgence les réponses et les moyens pour leur faire face. Or, ces moyens nous ont été confisqués en tant que société. Une poignée d'acteurs utilise les mécanismes d'un système qui leur profite pour camoufler leurs leur capitaux pardon, dans des paradis fiscaux et autres législations de complaisance. Les 40 dernières années ont été marquées par une déréglementation politico-juridique qui a laissé l'économie mondialisée asseoir partout ses propres normes, créant ainsi un terreau fertile pour l'évasion et l'évitement fiscal. Ce processus, qui a pris une ampleur planétaire, s'est soldé par le tarissement des finances publiques et la dépossession des populations de leurs propres institutions. Cette année, les conséquences néfastes de ces politiques ont montré leur aspect funeste. Le constat est clair, nous n'avons plus le loisir de poursuivre dans cette logique de dépossession. La fuite des capitaux nécessaires pour financer adéquatement nos services publics n'est pas une fatalité et les paradis fiscaux qui les camouflent ne sont pas un mal nécessaire. Dénoncer les discours, les mécanismes et les acteurs qui ont produit cette réalité, voilà le travail qu'effectue le collectif Échecs aux paradis fiscaux en apportant sa contribution à l'élaboration d'une nouvelle norme basée sur la justice fiscale. Depuis maintenant dix ans, le collectif Échec aux paradis fiscaux travaille à mettre la question de l'évasion et de l'évitement fiscal sur la place publique afin de permettre à la collectivité de se l'approprier de façon politique. Par politique, nous entendons d'abord le bien commun, mais également ce qui relève de l'organisation de la société et de ses finalités. À ce titre, la question des paradis fiscaux est paradoxale. D'une part, elle est déjà une chose publique, connue de tous, qui se manifeste bon an, mal an dans l'actualité et se révèle au public sous la forme du scandale. Pensons à l'affaire KPMG ou au Panama Paper, Paradise Paper, etc. Sans oublier la valse ironique, pleine de contradictions, de ces entreprises qui, recourant aux paradis fiscaux, ont été dans les premières à demander l'aide de l'État au début de la crise sanitaire. Ainsi, les paradis fiscaux sont connus des citoyens et provoque chez la très grande majorité d'entre eux un grand sentiment d'injustice. D'autre part, cependant, ces mêmes citoyens... Euh, pardon, excusez-moi. D'autre part, cependant, ces mêmes citoyens se sentent complètement démunis devant la question des paradis fiscaux. En étant organisés par des politiques obscures et des opérations comptables hautement complexes, les paradis fiscaux sont connus de non seulement leur existence tangible nous échappant complètement. C'est ici qu'Échec aux paradis fiscaux intervient. Sa mission est de démystifier la lutte aux paradis fiscaux auprès des citoyens et leur donner une légitimité politique de demander des comptes à leur gouvernement. La contribution d'Alain Deneau doit ici être soulignée. Grâce à elle, la question des paradis fiscaux a subi une traduction par laquelle il a été possible de la traiter à partir de ses effets délétères tels qu'ils sont vécus par les citoyens jour après jour dans toutes les sphères de nos vies. Une telle traduction vise à sortir des débats techniques et économiques dans lesquels les citoyens restent pris de la, prisonniers pardon, dans la tutelle des discours de l'économie. En prenant le problème à partir des conséquences tangibles qu'il crée dans la vie quotidienne, nous retrouvons également plus aisément les causes politiques qui ont rendu la planification fiscale abusive et le recours aux paradis fiscaux généralisés chez les multinationales. Nos gouvernements qui se disent contraints à l'austérité sont eux-mêmes responsables. Cette contrainte est la conséquence de leur propre politique de dérégulation de l'économie. Ce cadre d'analyse nous a permis de fournir une réponse intelligible à une situation complexe qui attise la colère des citoyens. Conscients de la perte d'acquis au niveau de la justice sociale, les contribuables de la classe moyenne portent désormais sur leurs épaules une part disproportionnée du financement des services publics. Ils ne sont pas dupes. Nombreux partagent cette vision que l'austérité a pour cause sous-jacente une décision politique qui va à l'encontre de l'intérêt de la société et de la vaste majorité de la population. 
nos interventions qui ont pris les formes de prise de parole publique, de manifestations, d'organisations de débats lors des élections, de réactions au budget ou encore de participation à des commissions publiques afin de proposer des réformes fiscales, on fait des chèques aux paradis fiscaux une référence en la matière dans la sphère publique québécoise. À ce titre, nos activités sont à comprendre comme une contribution au développement d'une critique des normes qui ont cours, tout en s'engageant activement à définir ce qui pourrait naître de cette critique. Car tous ces efforts visent ultimement à faire en sorte que nos sociétés réalisent que les moyens dont elles ont besoin pour faire face aux crises sont non seulement disponibles, mais sont en fait créés ici même. Dans la situation actuelle, ces moyens n'existent que sous forme de capitaux privés qui ont été usurpés aux sociétés à qui elles appartiennent. Les paradis fiscaux ne sont pas qu'une manière pour une élite de mettre des, des capitaux à l'abri de l'impôt. Ils sont également des institutions qui détruisent nos propres institutions. À ce titre, le plus grand défi qui nous attend est double. De part, il faut s'assurer de ne pas être dépossédé des moyens qui nous sont encore accessibles, et d'autre part, il faut lutter pour rapatrier ces capitaux pour les mettre à profit dans la transformation sociétale et politique qui est nécessaire. C'est pour cette raison que nous devons tenir compte des grandes tendances qui font surface. Parmi celles-ci, mentionnons que l'actuelle lutte des pays de l'OCDE et du G20 contre les paradis fiscaux est accompagnée par la transformation de ces mêmes économies en législation de complaisance sous le couvert de la compétition fiscale. Vous le savez très bien, nos propres économies ne sont pas à l'abri de devenir ce qu'elles-mêmes disent combattre. Pour conclure, permettez-moi de vous interpeller et de vous rappeler que nous avons tous un rôle à jouer dans cette lutte aux paradis fiscaux et dans cette transformation de nos économies pour une plus grande justice fiscale. Certains groupes citoyens travaillent à exercer une pression politique sur nos gouvernements pour faire contrepoids aux lobbies auxquels ils sont soumis. D'autres parmi vous, grâce à vos compétences et votre savoir-faire, peuvent contribuer en proposant des politiques et des règles fiscales qui mettraient fin à ces pratiques totalement illégitimes qui minent nos démocraties. Nous le savons, les concepts que nous utilisons pour comprendre ce genre de phénomène ne sont pas neutres et ils ont leurs propres charges normatives et politiques. Lorsque viendra le temps d'analyser les transformations les plus récentes de l'économie, travaillons ensemble pour que l'expertise technique que nous devons créer prennent en compte les besoins des populations de comprendre, réfléchir et agir sur les normes sous-jacentes à ces transformations. En ce sens, nous espérons vous retrouver à nos côtés pour redonner à nos sociétés ce qui leur a été pris, à commencer par la capacité d'établir leurs propres normes. Je vous remercie. So, I will now switch to English to uh, let Uh, Madame Huguette Labelle present uh, her work and her uh, position regarding uh, 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 justice in terms of uh, crisis. Thank you. I would like to express my appreciation to Tax Co-op for hosting this very timely conference. I think it's, it's very, especially with COVID-19, but not only. This is a topic which needs to be debated, discussed, and changes made. The massive amounts of resources either parked or flowing through tax havens continue to have a major impact on security, on peace, on the rule of law, and contributes to massive inequality around the world. Further, some of these resources are feeding terrorism, conflicts, and corruption. According to the World Bank, 70% of grand corruption cases result from anonymous companies moving financial assets undetected. And we also need to remind ourselves that global wealth is in the hands of a very few. It's estimated that about 1% of the world's riches own anywhere from 40 to 50% of the global wealth. Some of that is the result of tax evasion, if not a lot of it. The cost is huge, and tax havens make it possible to a large extent. There are resources, or there are various estimates of tax evasion. I will just use a few, uh, because some of the colleagues that have been attending this conference um, have been, um, you know, have been uh, publishing a lot of very interesting data, which I've used extensively. 
One is from the Tax Justice Next, Next, Next work, Network, I'm sorry, where they indicate that tax evasion is estimated at 3.1 trillion per year. Also, trade misinvoicing is, in, uh, is estimated at about 600 billion per year by global financial integrity. And tax avoidance for OECD countries alone is estimated at 400 billion per year by the IMF. And my colleague on this panel uh, from Canadians for Tax Fairness, uh, this organization has published some very interesting information and data. And one of them I'd like to remind all of us. And that is that Africa loses the equivalent uh, of 98% of its total healthcare cost due to tax evasion. And there's more data on that report, which means that no country is, uh, you know, is, is, is negative on that, that most countries, if not all, have some, some real serious problem. Um, so the overall, loss, the overall losses undermine the ability of governments around the world to serve the public interest. And it also means that it is the salaried people and the small enterprise who really end up supporting financially the essential services that we rely on to survive, as well as our physical infrastructure. With COVID-19, the entire world is now entering into a new era. Uh, it's estimated cost is already at 9 trillion, uh, according to the UN, and this was at the end of the summer. So it's probably higher at this time. And the emergency measures that were implemented very quickly are at times traded for transparency, for corruption safeguards, for oversight and accountability. So in order to ensure that these resources are used to meet the current needs and the purpose intended, it's more important than ever uh, to ensure that part of these do not find themselves in fiscal havens around the world for the purpose of local gain by individuals. I'd like to just identify a few contributing factors which the list is quite long. One is that we have too much opaque corporate and tax structures still today. That the asymmetry of information between multinational companies and authorities is also a factor. That the lack of regulatory framework, but especially the implementation of these frameworks concerning the facilitators of illicit financial flows uh, is lacking. And these are lawyers, accountants, notaries, real estate agents. And this is something that has been contributing significantly to the problem we're talking about today. And also the resilience and high capacity of networks operating through a number of private sector entities, such as financial institutions and shell companies, uh, are all some of the contributing factors to our topic today. I'd like to identify some actions that could be taken. Again, the list would be long, but I'll limit myself. First, the need to implement country by country reporting for companies. I'm always reminded of uh, a Norwegian, uh, the Norwegian um, state enterprise that was negotiating a concession in the Middle East for oil and gas. And when they were asked for a very hefty bribe from the minister responsible, that Norwegian was able to say, sir, if I give you any money, it will have to be reported publicly with your name on it in your country and in my country, because we have legislation in Norway that requires me to do that. Well, the demand was dropped and they did get the concession. I don't know <laughs> whether this would happen all the time, but at least it did. A second action that I would think is important is to enhance the national and international cooperation between tax authorities and investigative bodies. Some of that has started to take place in a bigger way, but it's still much too slow and too many countries uh, are not into that. And it's taking too much time whenever there is a request from one country to the other to share that information. My third point is that uh, as a preventive measure, especially that all countries should establish a public register of beneficial owners 
of companies, of subsidiaries, and of trusts. Um, again, some countries have started to do this, but not many. And it is very important that it happens. Uh, commitments have been made at the G20 and other groups, but I think we need to um, expect more than what we have. My other point is to introduce measures to deal with facilitators, as I mentioned before, of illicit financial flows, of tax evasion, and uh, of state capture. Uh, and here, uh, these individuals very often also promote tax loopholes and use the financing of political parties to acquire privileged access to legislators for future increased loopholes. Um, the last point that I would like to um, mention is that uh, we also need to enhance the stolen asset recovery to assist with tracing, freezing, and preferably developing a mechanism to place these funds in escrow and eventually return these assets to the country of origin when it is safe to do so, so that they don't go back to another door, to another bank. Um, and of course, STAR exists as cooperation between the UN and the World Bank. And the UN is now putting this again on, on the front burner. And this is great because I think we need to really deal with this much more. It is taking a very long time to be able to even sometimes freeze those assets and they could be several billion dollars in certain cases. So finally, I would just like to say that transparency builds trust, whether it is in companies, in governments, in our own organizations. That the academic sector has a very important role to play, uh, not only in how they prepare uh, managers of the future and public servants of the future, but also in ensuring that uh, they do bring in and they do report and they do publish on this sector. So tax justice remains central to the well-functioning of the world. And complacency is not the answer. So collective action between all of us remains so important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Labelle. I will now... Uh, I am now introducing to you uh, Toby Sanger from Canadian for Tax Fairness, who will uh, also address to uh, the public his introductory remark. Toby, thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I, and, and I also just wanted to say how pleased I am to talk uh, uh, with all of you at this really excellent conference. I wish we were there in person, but on the positive side, this online conference has enabled more to be involved from around the world on these critical global issues. I'm also really looking forward to um, uh, any questions that you that the audience might uh, uh, pose later on in the in the comment section um, uh, 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 through the website. I'm really interested in uh, in, in 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 their views and uh, and their comments. Um, I just wanted to start out by saying. Um, uh, this is this is obviously a a, 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 a summit, a world tax summit. Um, but uh, why why do we have taxes? I, 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 uh, this pandemic has really underlined how incredibly important government and public services are, healthcare most crucially, but also public support for individuals and businesses that has prevented a depression. And also how interconnected we are and how we should all be in this together. I mean, there's the interconnectedness of uh, the contagion of the pandemic, but there's the interconnectedness of our society as well. And that's really important. And as Joe Stiglitz said earlier in this, governments are also going to need much more revenue to pay for the costs of this crisis and to rebuild back better in the recovery when it comes. So through this uh, pandemic, we've also seen an acceleration of, of, uh, of trends, uh, of the disturbing trends of inequality and corporate concentration that we've seen over the past few decades. 
And that's a reminder that maybe we're not all in this together equally. Some, a wealthy few, and large corporations have not only been doing much better for decades, but they're also doing much better uh, through this crisis. So for example, in Canada um, and elsewhere, uh, in, in a number of other countries, only the very top 1% increased their share of wealth over the past decade. These are figures that I calculated from Credit Suisse. While the net wealth share of all other groups has either stayed the same or declined. Um, around the world, the top 26 billionaires um, have, ha have as much wealth as half of humanity. In the past six months of this crisis, the wealth of US billionaires has increased by over 800 billion. It's over a trillion Canadian dollars. Um, while in Canada, the top 40 billionaires have increased their wealth by 28% in the past six months. So it's been a real acceleration of these trends. Sometimes crises lead to disruption. This has been an acceleration. And meanwhile, it's the lowest incomes who have suffered the most from job loss, the highest uh, rates of unemployment, also the highest rates and deaths from this disease. Um, so also over the past few decades, we've seen growing corporate concentration around the world, greater market power amassed by large corporations across many industries. And during this pandemic, it's the larger corporations like Amazon and others whose stock prices have escalated the most and who have increased their profits uh, through the pandemic while smaller Main Street businesses are barely holding on. Now, these trends are related. Um, I think Brigitte talked a little bit about this, but uh, sometimes people see individual wealth and corporate wealth as different issues, but these trends are related by because by far the largest portion of individual wealth at the very top comes from business and corporate own holdings. Uh, there's debate over what, uh, what has caused increased corporate concentration. There are a number of different factors. I'm an economist, that's the way I see the world. Uh, but uh, regressive uh, studies that I have seen have, uh, have found that regressive tax measures have played the largest role, including lower rates of uh, in, uh, largest role in, in, in more in greater concentrations of extreme wealth, including lower rates of tax on corporations, cuts in business taxes, tax loopholes, lower taxes on capital, lower taxes on wealth, and the ability of the wealthy and larger corporations to avoid taxes in many different ways. It's the largest corporations in the world that have also been able to, most able to take advantage of tax havens uh, and also of international and domestic forms of tax dodging. I think earlier on in Monday, Alex McLean, the head of uh, uh, the Director General of the Offshore and Large Corporations Division, uh, said as much. He said it's, the, it's these bigger corporations that are focused on this and that really pushed the line. And their tax gap report from last year showed that as well. Uh, uh, some of the larger corporations pay tax at single digit rates, often lower than small and medium sized domestic contributors. And when all taxes are considered, it's, a, it's the top 1% uh, and, bi and billionaires that on average pay lower rates of tax than all other income and wealth groups. That was that's when you consider all taxes. So overall, our tax system has become not progressive, but it's actually regressive. And um, delving outside of economics, unless we take steps to reverse this, we're going to experience even greater concentrations of wealth and power, greater corporate concentration, more oligarchs, more strong men in power, and a whittling away of our democracies. Uh, even the OECD has recognized and people like Donald Trump have shown that wealth begets wealth. Uh, the wealthy are able to affect the policy and, uh, and, and, uh, and tilt the tables towards themselves. So these trends are, are disturbing and dangerous. They're bad for our economy. They're bad for our society. And they're also bad for de our democracy. I heard earlier from at, at this summit that old uh, discredited myth that countries need to keep business and top income tax rates low in order to grow the economy. I'm an economist. And in Canada, and I think in other countries, over the past two decades, we've seen rates of business investment decline in lockstep with lower corporate income tax rates. So it's the exact opposite of what was supposed to happen. So they haven't led to greater investment or growth, and instead they've led to greater accumulation of wealth, share buybacks, more million more millions for the millionaires and billions for the billionaires, and not greater 
business investment. So there'd been a multi hundred billion dollar policy failure. And even the IMF, the OECD, and the broader majority of mainstream economists now recognize these things and they agree that greater equality and stronger economic growth now go hand in hand. So it's really good to see the IMF. It was great to see the IMF and its chief economist say last week that while new revenue measures during this crisis will be difficult, government could consider uh, raising progressive taxes on more affluent individuals, including wealth taxes, and changes to ensure that firms pay taxes can commensurate with their profitability. So I absolutely agree. Some people talked earlier in this uh, conference and summit that we need fundamental tax uh, reform of international corporate taxation and and also broad progressive domestic tax a, tax reform. But um, right now, immediate priorities for reform should be things like uh, introducing an, an excess, uh, excess profits tax on the larger corporations that have profited during the pandemic, just as we had during the past two wars. In, in the Second World War, the excess profit tax actually generated more revenue than the general corporate income tax rate. Uh, uh, um, also, we should have a wealth tax on the very wealthiest, and there's been a lot of discussion about, about that in Canada and in other uh, countries. And absolutely, what is very crucial, as uh, Madame LaBelle spoke about uh, before, was uh, much greater transparency. There's many opportunities for abuse. I think the pandemic has brought out that there are a lot of opportunities for abuse in the large amounts of pandemic spending. Uh, uh, um, uh, we need to know who owns what companies. Canada is, uh, is, is, uh, is unfortunately a real laggard on this. We need a register, registry of beneficial ownership, a public, public registry, and also public reporting by large corporations of their finances and how much tax they pay in different jurisdictions. It's really incredible that we don't have this uh, yet. Uh, and, there, and so we need that public country-by-country uh, country reporting. Um, and this is critical to address the problem of tax havens. But Madame LaBelle made other, many other excellent points and suggestions. Other areas, of course, there was quite a lot of discussion earlier about, uh, about the OECD. Uh, I, I think that we also need a broad digital services tax on the e-commerce giants as an important interim measure uh, as we move, uh, in addition, as a step towards a fundamental reform of our international corporate tax system which needs to be pushed. I um, haven't talked much about it here, but um, I think the simple solution for that is the same way that we allocate um, uh, um, corporate income between provinces, which is by a simple formula. And that's a solution that we need to have internationally as well. We do it in Canada. It's done in the United States. Uh, and this is a type of solution that we should have internationally as well as a unitary uh, um, um, considering multinational enterprises as unitary enterprises and a minimum uh, a corporate tax rate. It was very interesting to hear the discussions of Brian Arnold and others this morning talking about the OECD reforms and how they'll actually just make the tax system more com uh, complicated. And there is a simple solution that we use in Canada and also that the states use that, uh, that, that should be applied internationally, a simpler solution. Of course, it, International co corporate tax rules are necessarily complex, but there are simple ways that we can simplify it instead of making it more complex. And then uh, lastly, I'm just going to talk about the other side of this. The, um, the pandemic, I think, has also shown how important it is to be able to efficiently get funds out to those who need it. Uh, one thing that we, our organization, Canadians for Tax Fairness, has also advocated for is automatic tax filing. A number of different countries have that. Uh, um, so people don't have to um, uh, go to tax preparers or struggle to fill, fill out their tax forms and to get the benefits that, they, that they're that they entitled to through the tax system. So it, um, it was great to see in the, uh, the recent federal throne speech that, uh, that the Canadian government is committing to introducing automatic tax filing. So benefits can get actually delivered to those who need them the most, because they're often the ones who struggle to fill out the tax forms. And it, and, um, and it got the sense from, uh, from the uh, representatives of the CRA that, uh, that, they're, that they're moving in that direction too. So these and other progressive tax measures would make the tax system much fairer. They'd raise significant revenues and they'd be good for the economy. 
And so they're a win-win-win. We don't often get that, but this is a direction that we can go in. I'm very interested to hear what, uh, what members of the audience have to say and other questions that might be raised. Thank you very much. Thank you both of you for your uh, introductory remarks. I'm sure that uh, this will lead to a very uh, fruitful um, discussion. Um, yeah, just you both addressed this in your um, opening remarks, um, but like if we were to think about the current crisis in terms of winners and losers, uh, but not necessarily because we kind of know who wins and who loses in this game, but to what extent to what extent are the winner winning and uh, what precisely are the losers losing in this in this situation so that uh, beyond the uh, like big names and uh, the, the the big numbers that we've seen uh, in the last month uh, we have a clearer picture of like what's really going on for those who are losing something Well, I think that it's. Um, I think that it's been fairly clear. I mean, from the remarks that I and 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 the figures that we've seen so far, um, I, 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 that it is. Uh, um, as I said, it's uh, the, the, the billionaires in Canada and the United States. Their 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 wealth has increased uh, enormously, um, and. Uh, um, what I also find disturbing and, 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 and uh, what might have long lasting uh, impacts is, uh, is also the impacts on different businesses. There's um, uh, those, the larger businesses and corporations that have got the means have, uh, have, have across a number of different sectors have done very well. And I, I, I despair about all the smaller businesses um uh, uh that that are that are going to go that are likely to go under and uh very concerned about uh increased uh corporate concentration throughout this as well i i'd like to, to just add to toby's point um looking at the so-called losers um people who have lost their job and even if they do get some compensation a temporary compensation from governments um, when they do, and not all countries have that, um, it's still much less than they were earning. And it leaves people with um, barely enough very often to buy food and certainly not always enough to pay the rent if people are renting, uh, if they do have a roof. So basically, I think that in the case of, uh, of the people who are already uh, at the poverty uh, level or uh, even low middle class would still have some of these problems. I think in many cases. Now, looking at the at the big winners, um, the big winners who have um, multiple streams of activities um, are likely to be, in some cases, doing much better. Uh, some of their uh, businesses. Uh, may not do as well for a period of time, but they are protected by some of the other, uh, you know, because they're very multi, multi-purpose uh, institutions. Um, so my sense is that you've got some of people who were winning before, not in the kind of way that we're talking about today, but who um, are on, in a stalled position, especially people who provide services and who might have done well, let's say, uh, in the um, food business, in the clothing business, uh, in, or in the construction area. Um, and so, you know, these people may not be doing as well today, or they may be on a on a stalled situation. But my sense is that the big winners. Um, have a lot of resources to be able to weather this, and some of them are making money out of it. And we and we have seen around the world. I mean, in Canada, certainly they, uh, 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 as I mentioned before, the, pe the 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 people who have suffered the most and uh, most jobs are. Um, it's been a she session. It's women. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, lower incomes. It's uh, it's. Uh, um, um, 
it's uh, racial minorities and uh, uh, um, and uh, and and other um, often marginalized people that have uh, that, that have absolutely um, uh, suffered the most, and they also don't have the resources to to uh, um, to rely on, and that's why the role that's why government has been so important, but also it hasn't uh, it, it hasn't necessarily provided enough uh, enough support for them. Thank you, both of you. Uh, follow up question regarding of this is, um, I think that it was clear from the opening remarks that both of you are uh, advocating for changes uh, in the, the current system. And uh, so regarding the, the situation as we live it today uh, and how you like you you portray the situation of the people who are uh, marginalized and uh, that are, that are uh, also on the losing side of this crisis uh, how could we challenge uh, the situation either in like kind of a policy making but also maybe in terms of like what kind of change of perspective uh, could we need or the government needs to be able to address better the situation okay well let me start i um, I think that some governments have done relatively well, um, and parliaments, some have done relatively well, at not trying to play too much politics with COVID and the programs, and have been able to, to implement you know, some, some of these programs. So basically um, when that is happening at least it can ride the wave it depends on how long the wave will be in terms of the availability eventually of resources uh, there will be a point when um, people will have to say uh, we've got to start um, tightening you know the situation because uh, resources may be less available and how we do in terms of gnp and so on in, in a number of countries. So that to me, but one point that I think I should um, add to this, it's not quite a direct answer to your question, but I think that, um, and I'm looking at the financial, international financial institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, the bilateral donors from around the world, uh, I think should spend much more energy in supporting developing countries uh, in assisting them to develop the kind of legal framework and systems and capacity in terms of people that they need to try to prevent some of the evasion, you know, some of the tax evasion and the misinvoicing, uh, you know, which is taking place. I remember speaking to the president of an African country who was telling me that, you know, there were four companies closing mines because they had been there for 20 years and there was nothing left. They had never paid one penny in taxes or in, in concession fees because of how they succeeded in doing misinvoicing, where they, they you know, put the cost of the product at such a low level and then transferred it to one place outside of that country and then to another one before it reached a real level of, of the price. So to me, this um, assisting countries in this regard um, would you know, help our world, uh, the world in its totality um, at this time. And I think we can all do it. It's a question of uh, having the will. But Toby will have a much better answer to your question than I have. <laughs> no, I won't. Well, your answer was pretty good too. I think it's... Uh... It's important to look at this aspect of like being able to to change a perspective from also national economy for to an international context in which we are struggling right now. Don't yes, it, it, yes, I, I I certainly second that. I, I, I mean, we have been so focused on 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 our international concerns throughout this pandemic, um, but the um, the challenges and the costs in in other countries outside of Canada. Um, are, are going to be um, uh, that much more massive uh, going forward, and uh, and and we certainly need a, a broader international perspective. In Canada, I, I mean, there's been quite a change in perspective um, over deficits al already. 
and about the government being able to uh, um, um, and, uh, uh, um, borrow money and or uh, print, basically create money. And Richard Murphy talked about this yesterday as well and understanding that. So there's been an, a, a, a very significant change in that perspective. Canada is uh, Canada and some other larger nations are, are, are able to do that uh, on this basis um, quite a bit easier than, than uh, a lot of other countries, which, uh, um, which don't have as strong currencies. Uh, um, and so that's another reason to, 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 that we need to take a, a stronger international perspective on this as well. Yeah. Thank you, both of you. Um, before we go for a question uh, from the public, maybe just a, a, a quick um, idea of like, there's a lot of talks uh, going on about economic recovery and to, to uh, address conditionality to this uh, recovery, whether it would be like a Green New Deal or um, transformation in the way that we, like we usually, um, uh, helped the economy to recover. Um, do you think that the crisis right now has like has to be seen as a, an opportunity to address a wider situation than uh, usually? Je suis Olivier Jacques, chercheur postdoctoral en sciences politiques à l'Université de Queens. Je voulais avoir votre avis sur la manière dont on pourrait payer pour les dépenses qui ont été encourues pour faire face à la crise de, de la COVID-19 et à la récession qui s'en vient. Donc, je me demandais, d'après vous, quelle serait la manière la plus efficace et la plus égalitaire d'augmenter les revenus de l'État en vue de résorber les déficits budgétaires Uh, auquel les uh, États font face, particulièrement au Québec et au Canada. Merci. Well, let's deal with with both of your questions. You asked uh, William about uh, about conditionality and Green New Deal. I, I mean, I think some of these these questions can and absolutely. I mean, I thought that uh, that the response to the last crisis, 2009, just uh, um, unfortunately did not deal with this. We spent a lot of money on concrete and bridges, and we did not build back better to address the other crisis outside there, outside that is uh, that is one of climate change. Um, um, uh, absolutely. I mean, this is this is this is an opportunity to do that. And we need to and we need to do that. Um, the other questioner, my my French isn't that good. But I think that he that that he asked, what is the best way to 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 augment the revenues of uh, of uh, of governments in Quebec and in Canada uh, throughout this crisis. Um, 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 is that correct? I, I think so, yeah. Too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, and I did talk about that. I mean, I, I don't think we need to be under any illusions. We certainly won't, we, we don't want to raise taxes in a massive way, which would, in, 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 a, in a very massive way, which would, uh, which would, um, which would undermine the uh, undermine the recovery. We're going to have to run deficits for some time, uh, but um, the IMF has also come out showing that uh, that, that uh, spending on public services is, uh, is, is has got a much higher uh, uh, economic impact. So we need to do that. But then, um, um, as the IMF has also said, you know, we we should be looking for um, to the wealthy and to uh, profitable corporations. As I said, to uh, to 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 generate some revenues. Which have the added um, bonus that, uh, that that they can reduce inequalities as well. But we also, you'd ask you about a change in perspective. I think that people um, will want to demand more transparency in a lot of different ways, as uh, as uh, Madame Labelle outlined. Uh, we need transparency over where the spending is. We need transparency over how much tax different people pay, and transparency over who owns what to to uh, reduce chances of corruption and, uh, and fraud as well. I'd just like to add uh, to, to Toby's point, um, going back to conditionality and, um, and how does one, what are the areas that we need to, to really put in on the table uh, as we move forward? And uh, certainly um, areas that need need uh, our attention and uh, climate change definitely as you've mentioned Toby 
But there's also the fact that what this crisis has demonstrated to us, that we have not been taking the kind of attention um, to people who require long-term care. And that is not just in Canada, it is around the world. We're seeing where a lot of the cases uh, of people who die uh, are older people who are in, uh, in chronic care or long-term care institution without the kind of services that are required, the kind of attention that is required, the kind of staff that one would need to have. So um, I think that, you know, going forward, I'm only raising two uh, of, of the issues that, in a sense, one that's been longstanding in terms of the climate change, but the other one which suddenly surfaced and has been longstanding as well, but not dealt with, which is the, the long-term care. Now, the, the list could be much longer, of course, but to me, these are two areas that as we move forward, um, that should be part of the conditions that exist for how we use the future resources and, and uh, where we uh, decide that more resources is needed in particular areas, perhaps for the long-term benefit that it could provide us. I'm thinking of climate change here. Thank you, both of you. Um, to follow on that, uh, the question of how we could uh, make revenue go higher in a recovery of economy. Um, you, uh, Madame Labelle, talked in your uh, in your opening remarks about repatriation of uh, capitals that uh, were just uh, hiding outside of the, the country. Uh, the like there, we know that Canada has done nothing. Uh, substantively about the Panama Papers uh, information, for instance. Um, uh, so how could we use the situation right now as a leverage to uh, bring back uh, these capitals, but also the question as a, like, as a political question that it is, uh, back on the table uh, of discussion? Yeah, I think there are, you know, a number Number of ways, but certainly one of them is to prevent the money from leaving, as of now, uh, but also of repatriating what is there, or of getting the uh, individuals who have these resources in these countries to pay. They can leave it there, but they have to pay taxes in Canada because it was earned in Canada. Um, so there are a number of, but you know, of, of things that can be done. But certainly. Um, the tax, um, the whole tax area would need to be re-looked at, as well as the strength of investigative bodies and of our tax institutions and the collaboration between the various ones. Now, the Financial Action Task Force of the OECD, which um, develops list of tax havens, which one would hope, you know, would be, um, uh, well, it's certainly very useful, but would be better used in the way that, that it is now. Um, and we can, you know, one could do quite a bit more with the results or with these reports from the Financial Action Task Force, uh, which has been doing quite a lot of work in this regard, and it is an institution of the OECD. But Toby will have the best answer, I'm sure. I don't think so. Well, <laughs> I, 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 we we had talked. Uh, there'd been discussion earlier in this uh, in this summit over over uh, uh, about the uh, the negotiations to the inclusive framework at the OECD. Uh, these are absolutely crucial uh, uh, discussions that have been going on, um, and um, uh, the, the basically the BEPS two point zero. Uh, uh, measures and 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 it's absolutely crucial that we reform fundamentally reform international corporate tax rules. Unfortunately, the the blueprint put out by the OECD uh, doesn't go nearly far enough on on this, and it will be further complicate the tax system uh, um, uh, on that. It looks like it will raise uh, as. Um, the IMF estimated that there's uh, over $600 billion that's lost through uh, um, to governments worldwide, $600 billion US um, through uh, corporate tax shifting by corporations. 
that's about two thirds of the problem. The, the proposals from, from the OECD would only get at about a tenth of that. That's a demonstration of how inadequate they are. Um, so it's important for, for uh, there's, we, we should have, it's better to have a consensus international solution but uh, but but it, but if that solution isn't isn't strong enough, individual states also need to take action themselves. Yeah. And there's a number of different things that that Canada can and other nations can and should do on this. Uh, some were promised during the last election in terms of in terms of limiting the 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 opportunities for dodging taxes, ending the double non-tax treaties and agreements with a whole lot of different countries, increasing enforcement, like Madame LaBelle said, and, uh, and, and, and getting at measures that allow um, uh, corporations to dodge taxes, both domestically and internationally. And there are some very obvious ones there. Some were promised, there, but, but there are other measures that can take place. And countries can, as uh, Brian Arnold said this morning, uh, you know, there, there are a whole lot of unilateral measures that countries can take. So can't be off the hook by, by for countries to say we're waiting for an international agreement to take place to 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 happen. Uh, yes, that is a preferred solution, but uh, but 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 we need to implement unilateral measures in a, in a range of different areas uh, uh, to to uh, to end the, the, the basically the scourge of uh, of tax dodging and have a minimum international corporate tax rate as uh, as uh, as th there was a dis discussion about that earlier this morning. Thank you. Uh, as our hour is already uh, com coming to a close, we will take one last question from the public and uh, then uh, answer it and come to conclu conclusion remarks. Bonjour, je m'appelle Arandal Sedras. Euh, je pense que s'assurer de percevoir la juste part d'impôt de chacun, c'est une chose, mais comment s'assurer de redistribuer de manière juste et équitable cet argent à travers les services publics? Euh, selon moi, ce sont deux aspects importants lorsqu'on parle de justice fiscale. Merci. Euh, vous parlez de la redistribution. Je vais juste reprendre un peu de la redistribution entre les pays ou, afin, ou, ou l'aide entre les pays? Uh, I think that it was about how we redistribute uh, within one society the uh, money that was collected from taxes. Okay. Uh, Toby, uh, just to, to clarify the question was, uh, it is one thing to be able to collect uh, taxes uh, within like a framework of uh, fiscal uh, justice, tax justice, but it's the other aspect is also how to spend it uh, in a way that uh, helps uh, tax justice. Very important. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Madame Labelle. Right. Okay. Well, I, you know, I think that this is where, um, I think this is a very important question, which is really, um, the distribution of resources. And it goes back to things like, uh, what is the minimum wage that one should have? What is the social system, social support system is available for people? And where, you know, you need to put resources in this if you're going to have greater equity um, within countries between the people. Um, and of course, if you have taxes from those who put their money away um, to use, then your the income or the, the treasury has more resources in order to be able to do that. Because I think your point is very well taken. And one can look at a variety of things, whether, for example, if you're looking at the cost of higher education um, for, for those who cannot afford that. Um, and where if they were, you know, the fee for one year is more than their family earns in one year. Uh, very difficult then for those people to think how they can get on to higher education from where they are. So I think that, you know, I'm just using a few examples, 
but there would be many more that can be used, but it's a very important question. Thank you. It's hard to say, um, it's hard to say one area. There are, there are so many different needs out there uh, um, uh, in, in, in many different areas. Uh, uh, Madame Labelle talked about the importance of uh, more funding for long-term care. Um, there's importance of education. So, so, so parents and particularly women can go back to work uh, for things like pharma, for pharma care, essential drugs. Um, there's this, uh, this um, um, pandemic has also revived interest and in talk about a, about a basic income, guaranteed annual income, um, and, and, and supports in, in that way. I, I think that uh, expanding public services and basic public services uh, broadly, um, not just to people in Canada, but also, but also to around the world, is a, is a better way of dealing with, uh, with, with the essential needs that people have in that way, rather than just sending them checks. Um, but monetary support uh, to the lowest income is also uh, very important in different ways, in targeted ways. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, it's almost all the time that we have. Uh, we covered uh, like a lot of subjects, broad subjects that show that uh, a citizen perspective on uh, these issue uh, really uh, covers a day-to-day -day life in a way. Um, would you like to have any conclusion remarks, Madame Labelle? I think that, you know, there is one conclusion remark is just an addition to my previous comments, which I, um, I think is very important. And this is enhancing the technological capacity and response of governments and investigative bodies to counteract the rapid changing use of digital technologies by organized crime network and by those who are evading paying taxes and who move um, money around from one place to the other uh, to so that it becomes undetected. So to me, this is one area that I thought I, I missed and uh, that, that might be important. But again, I'd like to go back and hope that the tax uh, um, co-op will be able to use some of the documentation that has been put forward, some of the ideas that have been forward, put forward, and maybe um, publish, um, not necessarily what everybody has said, but uh, publish a, a sort of a, a referendum on what are the things that could be done to improve uh, the tax uh, the tax evasion in our country and the illicit flows going out of our country and other countries, of course. We're talking internationally as well. That's a powerful idea. Thank you. Toby. Yes, I'd, I'd like to um, uh, say I know people were, were six, seven months into this pandemic, people are, 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 are getting exhausted. And, uh, and and frustrated, but I think we also need to reclaim some of the um, uh, the early ambition and um, uh, 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 and that we saw early on in the crisis. We saw governments moving in an incredible and and, and often it was the revenue authorities uh, did incredible jobs of 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 of, of quickly designing programs. Uh, um, they weren't perfect. Uh, we understood that nothing is perfect, but quickly designing programs that, that, that prevented uh, a, a, a lot more suffering and, a lot, and prevented uh, us going into depression, actually. Uh, I, and, and it was the revenue services that played a major role in this. Um, we've basically constructed a new um, a, a social uh, uh, architecture from this in a matter of a few weeks, and the, and it was the uh, public servants and the and and uh, and and the and government officials that were able to do this. People work collectively in that, and uh, and they realize that uh, that by working together, uh, I, I, we we could confront this 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 massive challenge. Um, and and I really hope that we take that forward. 
in terms of it, and, 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 and realize that we can address these problems, that, 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 that we can have grander ambitions of addressing the big problems that face us outside of this pandemic. We, um, people learned that lesson during the war years and took that for decades to rebuild a more equitable and fairer society. And I really hope that we are able to take that ambition and that knowledge that, yes, we can make things a lot better uh, in the future uh, if we work together and we have the means to do that. So that's, that, that's, a, that, that, that's something that I, that, 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 that I hope people take from this conference and I hope that they take it together that we can, that, uh, that, 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 that we can dream bigger thoughts and, that, and, and confront these bigger problems and, uh, and, and, and tackle them. Very well said. Yeah, I agree. And uh, so what I will uh, think about in a few next hours is ambition, referendum, working together. I think that uh, this is a nice constellation to end this discussion with. Uh, thank you again for being uh, with us today and for sharing your thoughts about the, the situation we're currently living in. It was really appreciated from both of you. Thank you.